Today on the Home Winemaking Channel, we've got a really exciting episode, and we're going to talk about some common winemaking mistakes. As we're coming into the winemaking season, a lot of you guys are probably firing up some wines, and you're thinking, man, I hope I don't forget to do something, or I hope I don't do something wrong and ruin all this hard work. So I thought, let's put together some, some things that I think are good things to keep in the back of your mind so you don't mess them up. Some thing, mistakes I've made in the past, some mistakes a lot of I know you guys have made in the past. And let's try to refresh it before we go into this uh, winemaking season. If you guys have made any of these mistakes or ones that I have not mentioned here, please mention in the comments. I love to hear from you guys and I think it's cool that we can all kind of share experiences together. The first thing on my list, this is such a common thing I hear from people that just get into wine. I remember when I first got into wine, people would tell me this, that you have to rack the wine a bunch of times and that the, the better, the more the rack, the more times you've racked that wine, the better the quality. So you hear people say, oh yeah, I racked this wine 10 times, check out how good it is. Well, that is, that couldn't be further from the truth. Every time you rack that wine, you're introducing oxygen to it. It's not that the wine doesn't need to be racked. And when I say racked, I mean siphoned off of the things that settle out in that carboy or the lees. But it, it really shouldn't be racked more than it needs to. If you're making a white wine, for instance, you'll usually crush and press those grapes, let it settle, and rack it off that stuff that settles out and ferment it. You'll probably rack it at the end of fermentation and you'll be lucky if you need to rack it one more time beyond that. Red wine's gonna be a similar case. You're gonna ferment usually on the skins unless you're making a red wine from a juice, which definitely recommend making a red wine from grapes. Get that skin contact time if you wanna make a good premium red wine. But after you press, after fermentation, all this stuff settles out. It's called the gross lees as opposed to the fine lees. You wanna rack off that after about 24, maybe 36 hours. And then you go into malolactic fermentation. You'll, you'll probably rack at the end of malolactic fermentation. It just depends on how much settles out of that wine. And then at most, again, maybe one more rack. So in general, we're looking at two to three rackings per wine. And my general rule of thumb is if the sediment or the lees are above about you know three eighths of an inch to a half inch in height at the bottom of that carboy, then I like to rack it. Unless you're doing something unique like you're intentionally aging on the lees. But we can go ahead and say racking 17 times. I don't see any scenario where that's something I would recommend doing. Next is headspace management. So there's a few things you can really mess up when it comes to headspace. And what I mean there is the amount of space above the wine in your vessel. This could be a carboy, it could be a barrel, it could be a fermenter. But usually what I'm talking about here is a carboy. The first way you can kind of mess this up is if you're fermenting a white wine, which I, ferment, I commonly will ferment in a carboy, you often might think, I'll just like fill it right up to the top. Well, that wine can get a little crazy and vigorous when it gets going. So if you fill all the way up to the top, it's not unheard of for that wine to kind of start to spew over the top, especially if you start to make some additions like nutrient additions. So you always want to leave a little bit of headspace. I usually like to leave about um, a fifth of the container volume of headspace. You can do, do a little bit more than that. I don't like to go too much less than that though. You can also have too much headspace. And when I say this, I mean more during the aging period of that wine. So a young wine that's actively fermenting can consume a huge amount of oxygen. That yeast loves oxygen and it'll eat it right up. You're not gonna oxidize a wine that's actively fermenting. But when you get into that aging period, the wine really does not want oxygen. I mean, a little teeny bit, there's something called microoxidation, can help smooth things out over time, but we are talking very, very, very little amounts of oxygen that you want during that aging period. 
So what you would do is top up that carboy to the neck. So you only want about an inch of head space above the neck of that, or above the top of that wine where you've got your wine and your airlock. And that just kind of helps to prevent oxidation. You don't have all this surface area like you have when you have you know, a not topped up carboy and you've got a lot of airspace there. I see some people, this is kind of along the same lines, I won't call this its own thing, but everyone's into these big mouth bubbler things. I think it's when home brewers in the beer scene come into winemaking, they're like, yeah, I want this huge like top on my carboy and then I have, it's easier to clean, it's better. But really the carboy with the tiny neck is just a great aging vessel. When you go away from that and you get into these big necks, it works okay as a fermenter, but I wouldn't use that to age a wine. These small volumes are really, really vulnerable to oxidation because it's just easy to dissolve a lot of oxygen into it compared to, you know, a thousand gallon batch in a winery where they've got this massive amount of wine and just a little bit of oxygen above it. Next would be along the lines of, again, oxygen management but more during fermentation. I mentioned that yeast can consume a lot of oxygen. Well, during fermentation, you're really looking for this equilibrium of too little and too much oxygen. And it is hard to have too much oxygen during fermentation, but it's really, really easy to have too little oxygen, especially with some of these yeasts that are really oxygen and nitrogen hungry. So if you don't intentionally allow a little bit of oxygen to that wine during fermentation, what will happen is it'll lean reductive. So reductive is kind of the op opposite of oxidized. And when a wine starts to lean a little too reductive, that's when you get these smells like rotten egg, sulfur, hydrogen sulfide smells. And if that goes untreated, it can turn into mercaptan, which is more of this burnt rubber characteristic in a wine that is virtually impossible to eliminate once you get to that stage. If you do find that you're, you're down here sniffing your wines daily, which I recommend during fermentation, and you catch a little whiff of that sulfur, hydrogen sulfide, I'd recommend splashing it up, um, intentionally giving that wine a lot of air. And it's also an indication that you might be a little bit low on nitrogen, so you might want to give it a little bit of yeast nutrient, and it could also be an indication that you're drifting out of the safe temperature range for that yeast to work within. So you might want to modify the fermentation temperature a little bit. Next will be something that I think a lot of home winemakers did when they first started, especially if they were like 21 years old when they started making wine. And that is, you get your packet of EC1118 yeast, which is the yeast that we all started with, and it says ferments up to 18% alcohol. And then you're looking at your hydrometer and it has this alcohol scale. And depending on how much sugar you put in that must will depend on how much alcohol it makes. Well, naturally, as a 21-year-old, you say, well, absolutely, I wanna make 18% alcohol. So you make all these wines, you're making a peach wine, you're making a strawberry wine, these wines that cannot handle that kind of alcohol without tasting like ethanol plus fruit, you're making 18% alcohol with those. And I just, if you really want to improve your wines, just don't do that. If you want that much alcohol, make twice as much wine. Don't add twice as much sugar. A more advanced problem that you'll have, once you get to the point where you're really managing acids in wine, so you might have a pH meter and you're thinking, oh man, I got to add a little acid. I got to neutralize a little bit of acid. An issue you might run into is overcorrection. So you're thinking you need to add a little bit of tartaric acid and you just add the exact amount you think you need based on some recommendation on the packet and you overshoot the target and now you're stuck. You're like, now I've got to add potassium bicarbonate and swing it back and you overshoot again. You don't want to do that, but it's something that we've all probably done when we first started managing acids in wine. What you really wanna do is sneak up on it. I'll usually add about half of what I think I need when it comes to adding acids or um, things like potassium bicarbonate to swing things the other way. 
And the reason I don't add the, the number that it says on the packet or the number that some calculation says is because each wine can react substantially different. I mean, way different. And the reason for that is it's really complicated. It's not just a simple solution of tartaric acid and water that you're dealing with. You have things like potassium in there. You have acid buffers and you don't know how much of those buffers are in there. And until you know how that wine is going to react to those additions, you want to kind of go a little bit light on it. And it's not that big a deal. You can kind of over the space of a fermentation, get those numbers to where you want them to be by the time you're at the end. Along the line of acids, I see this shockingly common, especially when you're getting grapes from a warm climate like Central Valley, California, these big farmed grapes is these runaway pHs. So people will get a wine in and, or a, a grapes in and they'll crush them and they'll find that their pH is already 3.8. And at 3.8, now you ferment it, it's gonna climb to something like 4.0 there's probably hardly any malic acid in these grapes, but if there is, it's gonna climb even higher. Now you've got a, a wine at a pH of something like 4.1. That wine is, number one, way out of balance most likely. It's gonna need a ton of tannin to offset that low acid. And it's also really, really vulnerable to spoilage. Unless you're a really experienced winemaker, a wine at a pH of 4.1 will spoil like that. You'll have a film on it and then you'll be messaging me about, hey, I've got this film on my wine. How do I fix it? <laughs> so hopefully you're just getting grapes that aren't in that situation. But when you are, I usually like to correct it down to about the range of 3.6. So if you look at the disassociation constants of tartaric acid, the 3.6 is right in the middle of the two constants. So the higher above 3.6 you are, the more it's gonna to wanna to run up on you. And if you get way below 3.6, it actually will wanna run down on you if you um, are dropping out potassium by tartrate, by cold stabilizing and things like that. So I don't wanna correct it insane amounts, but for a red wine, I usually like to be around that 3.6-ish range. For a white wine, I like to be 3.1, 3.2 when I start a fermentation. Now, another thing I often wonder when someone says, hey, my uh, white wine is has a pH of 2.5, is, is that pH meter calibrated? You really, really want to have some pH buffer, some 4.0 and 7.0 buffer to calibrate that pH meter, especially when you're starting to question things like this, because you don't want to make an adjustment only to find that the wine was totally fine, your pH meter was the problem. Next, this is a total rookie move that, again, we've probably all done, and it is having corks blowing off of bottles because the wine wasn't stable when it went into bottle. If you want to bottle a wine with residual sugar, you really need to somehow assure that there's no yeast in there or virtually zero yeast in there or that you somehow stabilized it. And the home, the best way to stabilize a wine at home is gonna to be to use potassium sorbate. So this is also sorbic acid. It's found naturally in some fruits, but what it does is it coats a yeast cell and prevents it from budding or creating new yeast cells. Cause all it takes is a few cells to bloom into a larger population of yeast that can actually ferment that wine. You can still screw this up though. So if you add the potassium sorbate and the wine isn't crystal clear at the time of addition, there might just be enough yeast in that wine to keep fermenting even without it blooming into a larger population. You could also sterile filter the wine, but the home filtration solutions really just are not quite to the level of, you know, sterile to confidently bottle a wine by sterile filtering at home. A lot of wineries will use something called dimethyl dicarbonate, which kills the yeast and then um, breaks down into carbon dioxide and methanol, minuscule amount of methanol, and no one wants to hear that, but that's a thing that happens. It's also not particularly harmful. 
all wines have a minuscule bit of methanol in them. If you know anybody that's into distilling, they just make sure they pull that stuff off and separate it from the final batches of, of um, whiskey or whatever they're making. This is gonna be, this next thing is gonna be something I think is really plagues the winemaking, even professional industry, but especially home winemakers. And it's gonna be misdiagnosing a problem. And the most common misdiagnosis is gonna be, oh, I must not have cleaned my equipment enough. I better clean my wine press better. I better clean my crusher better. I better clean my racking cane better. And I'm not promoting that you should be using disgusting, really filthy equipment. But the reality is you're bringing these grapes in off of a vineyard. They're coming in with bugs on them. They're coming in with bird poop on them and they're not sterilized. It's not like home brewing where you have this boiling thing that's sterilizing that, that um, wart. No, we're working with live stuff. There is bacteria in there. There are wild yeasts in there and it's up to us to learn how to manage that. You're managing biology. You can clean your, your crusher destemmer as much as you want, but it's not gonna stop the fact that that piece of bird poop <laughs> went through there. So just recognize that winemaking is probably more, has more in common with gardening than it does with cooking. You're not really recipe following, you're kind of watching you're seeing what's happening and you're trying to be proactive, but sometimes you're also reacting to things that you're seeing. If you see a bunch of spots on the leaves in your garden, you don't have to go out and start washing the dirt more of your garden. You probably have some sort of spray that you need to spray to take care of whatever that fungus is that's causing those spots. And if you don't do anything, Usually, you might not have a garden left. If the deer are eating your garden, you're saying, you know what, I wanna go, I don't wanna do anything, I'll just let the garden do its thing. Well, the deer are gonna eat the whole garden, it's gonna be gone. <laughs> so, it's really good to learn about what's really happening at a, at a you know, microbial scale here. And, in, and it's not that difficult, you just need to put a little bit of effort into it. For the most part, yeast is the most competitive thing that wants to eat the sugars in that wine. So wine or juice does want to turn into wine, but sometimes it can go a little bit off course on its way there. And in worst case scenario, it might go so far off course that it's really not good wine anymore. A lot of new winemakers, I think you, you go browsing the pages of these winemaking supply shops and you're like, oh yeah, I need oak, I need all this stuff and you just want to add oak to everything. Well, don't. There's wines that pair well with oak. Most red wines can take oak and it can be complementary. But like some of these white wines I make, if you're making like a Concord wine, a really fruity wine, oak is probably not something that you're gonna to want to add to that wine. Now, sure, go ahead and do all this experimentation, but you might wanna do a side-by-side -side if you're gonna do something way off the beaten path and see, do I really like the one with oak better than the one without oak? Most white wines though, I won't oak. There's few exceptions. Things like Chardonnay can take some oak and still be pretty good. But most of the time, you want this crisp, clean white wine. And then kind of along those same lines would be, you get some free grapes and you have a wine that might be your favorite wine. So. Maybe you really love um, Syrah or something, but you got some free Concord grapes and you're like, I wanna make this dry oaked wine and it's gonna be just like this Syrah. It's not. There's grapes that you, you kinda wanna make the, the best wine that you can with those grapes. If I got some free Concord grapes, the wine I'm probably gonna make is probably this people pleaser. It's kinda, Tastes like Welch's grape juice, but it's a wine. If I get some Cabernet Sauvignon, I'm not gonna probably try to make this really juicy juice bomb. I'm actually gonna make a real dry, bold red wine. You really wanna try to get the right grapes for the wine that you're making. And this also goes for fruit. I mean, you're probably not gonna make a oaky strawberry or peach wine. 
I know there are a ton of more mistakes you can make. A lot of them end in big messes all over the floor. If, like I said, if you've had any of these mistakes, be sure to mention in the comments. And if you wanna support the home winemaking more and get access to some more uh, information like this, be sure to check out my Patreon page, patreon.com slash make wine. And you can also swing by my website, smartwinemaking.com. Thanks for watching.